thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. And we will continue now with a more clinical aspect. And I was asked to report about the experience with more than one million cycles in our registry. There we will have three questions. Do we need such great database in reproductive medicine? What is it? And what can we expect from such a database? Do we need it in the time when we have the evidence pyramid in which randomized controlled trials and meta-analysis with those devices we have reached the summit? Is it so? Or sometime is it a high wire act? They are saying that randomized controlled trials are free of bias. Is it really so? And when we look a large um, meta cocaine meta-analysis, the authors were very astonished to see when they compared two different drugs that the results depend a lot from the sponsorship. And so um, we can't say that all randomized controlled trials are free of biases. And what kind of evidence are we looking for in doing such studies? Is it really a clinical evidence or only a mathematical evidence? When we look PubMed, for example, and we ask for all publications since 1970 for IVF, statistically significant, you will find 862 publications listed in PubMed. If you then ask IVF not statistically significant, you will find more than 16,000. And so we have to ask, this increase from here to here, this increasing number of randomized controlled trials without result, is it due to real clinical effects or only due to a large confidence interval because of too low numbers of observations? One example, another Cochrane meta-analysis in which other two drugs were compared and first they looked concerning the clinical pregnancy rate. They found 6,571 cases and you see that the odds ratio was 0 0.84 and the confidence interval showed statistically significance. Then they continued and they looked for the so-called ongoing pregnancy. Now only 5,000 cases. The odds ratio 0 0.88 and now the confidence interval reaches one, which means no more statistically significant, statistic significance. And then they looked for the life birth rate Odds ratio once more, 0 0.86, but only in 1,500 cases. And you see what happened to the confidence interval. The odds ratio didn't change dramatically, but the confidence interval due to lower number of observations changed completely. When we look to the clinical results, and we illustrate the comparative risk, then we can see that there is really no difference between the results and concerning life birth rate, ongoing pregnancy rate, or clinical pregnancy rate. When then we did our study with more than 2,300, uh, 2, 200,000 cases, then you see other results. These are clinical results and we tried to exclude also a certain bias in creating subgroups by age 
and by number, by treatment cycle. And you see that in all subgroups with high numbers, then there was all the time a statistic significance concerning the delivery rate. What we have to do, and Dominique de Siegler said it, we have not to create standard deviations, we have to deal with clinical and results. And here, such a great database can prescribe us the daily practice, because the daily practice is characterized by great heterogeneity of patients, no selection of patients, normally no strict entry or exclusion criteria, an extreme variability in the patient's factors, and often unexpected events. And this is called life conditions. And here, since more than 30 years, we have a systematic data collection in reproductive medicine in Germany. All started 1982, the year when the first IVF baby was born in Germany. Then it continued on a voluntary base. At the beginning, only five centers. Then in 1996, 71 center. And in this year, we did a complete reorganization. <coughs> Since 96, the data collection is done only electronically, prospectively, and cycle by cycle. Since this year, um, the results from Germany are published in a so-called yearbook, which since 2009 appears also in English, and you can find it on the web, on our website of the registry, or on the website uh, where it is published. In 2011, next uh, month we will publish the report for 2012, 128 centers participated, and this means all centers in Germany participated um, to the registry. We have several <coughs> software to document the data, the DIR own um, software, which is only an um, electronic questionnaire of all the items we want to have, or um, the rec date on our the commercially version and the commercial version Meditex um, software, which is for all purposes in such a center. In both programs, we have also this, that the user automatically in, uh, during the data entry are informed if the data are collected prospectively, which is not the case here, and um, if the data are correct, the plausibility control is also done online. We have several software programs, and all of them have to cooperate with a certain interface, which is called DIR DLL. And here, the DIR DLL can work with any Windows software. But the software has to respect the data catalog of the registry. There must be a real-time communication with the interface, so plausibility and prospectivity checks can be done online. The plausibility control is first, for example, to avoid transposed digits, like date of birth, as I showed here, an 18 instead of 81. And there's also an algorithm for plausibility plausibility control, so that the user is informed about the plausibility at every step where he is giving data into the system. 
And we have the prospectivity. Prospectivity, the definition is that the cycle has to be announced into the system within day one, at two, at least day eight of stimulation, meaning before we know the result of the treatment. And what can we expect from such database? Since uh, electronically documented treatment cycles since 1996, we have now more than one million, and when we take all the other documented cycles before, um, the figure is now 1.2 million cycles that we can have as statistic base for several considerations. You see how um, <coughs> two treatment modalities developed during the year. In red, the so-called ICSI, in blue, the IVF, you see that something happened in 2000, and especially in 2004. In 2000, um, the national health system wouldn't, uh, didn't pay for the ICSI treatment, and in 2004, the government changed completely the reimbursement policy concerning art treatment, and you see what happened. We had a decrease of more than 50% in this year. In the following year, uh, more and more ICSI cycles were redone. No movement concerning IVF treatment. But this is a consideration that we have all over Europe. Here you have the ASHRI data um, from 2009. And here you can see the same development as we saw in the German registry. Up to 2011, more than 170,000 deliveries are documented. Probably it's even about 200,000. And what we can say is that about 25,000 children of these are born after cryopreservation of the oocytes in the so-called 2PN stage. You see what happened with the age of our patients during the last years. We had a real increase, especially in the age of the women. And now, in mean, all women treated by these treatment modalities are at the mean age of 35 years. Concerning the clinical pregnancy rate during the years, we see a slight increase in IVF and ICSI treatment and a real increase in the so-called cryopreservation thawing treatment of oocytes or uh, embryos. The chances of such a woman depends and from the age as you can see here, the red bars, and you see also how the miscarriage rate is increasing with the age. Concerning the miscarriage rate all in all, you see that during the year there was a decrease in the miscarriage rate but what is astonishing and what we have to look for is why all the time the miscarriage rate in the so-called cryo-thawing procedure is of about five percent points higher as compared to the others. Is it the effect of the cryo-procedure or is it the fact that often those embryos are embryos of second choice because the best embryo is used in the first treatment. All is done in an anonymous way, but nevertheless, especially the data management group has a certain kind of corresponding with the centers by those center Profiles. What does it mean? Um, at least two times a year, the center is receiving 
such a profile where the results of all centers are included and by the red line the center can see his own position. Here it is the quality of the data which is measured by the proportion of plausible cycles and you see here the position of this center. For our example the clinical pregnancy rate after cryopreservation and you see here the position, a good position of the center or clinical pregnancy rate after IVF treatment and you see that the center is nearly between the last 10 percentiles. And here you see also the reason because the mean age in this center is less as compared as in the other centers. And so we can correspond to the centers and also do education. During, uh, since 1997, the, number, the mean number of embryos transferred decreased of about 20%, especially in the fresh cycles. Now you would say 20%, what is the clinical effect? Isn't there a clinical effect? And indeed, there's a real clinical effect when we look now that in 1997, eight, more than 8% of all babies born after such a procedure were triplets, and in 2009, only 1.66, that means we had a reduction in the proportion of triplets of more than 80%. And this is also an effect of the educational work of the IVF registry. We have also special statistics here, how the time and to treatment decreased during the year, that's clear. And with the increasing age, the patients are feeling that the time is running away. You can see how often a treatment was done in the different uh, patients and that there exist patients in which 10 and more si treatment cycles are performed. And if they continue until a tenth cycle, then we can see, see also that the total probability per woman for pregnancy at the tenth treatment cycle is of about 80%. And this is, I think, I'm convinced, a very important figure for political discussions. We saw very, very well how many oocytes should be captured um, to have a good pregnancy rate. And it is about, as we see also in other publications, um, 11 to 15 oocytes. Then we will have a maximum in clinical pregnancy rate. We can also look for the use of different um, drugs. Here you see how the so-called recombinant FSH developed since 1998. And once more again, we see political influences in every time when the costs for the patients are higher. My colleagues in Germany have the tendency to prescribe the more uh, assumed cheaper drugs. And then there is a switch to HMG, what we are seeing also depending from age in women older than 40 years, more HMG is prescribed as compared to recombinant FSH. And we can't understand why, because in another study with 25,000 cycles, we could demonstrate that the recombinant drug is more efficient as compared to the urinary drug. On other um, regimen, 
changed completely in this time. The GNIH antagonist and GNIH long protocol, you can see in the last year, in 2011, more antagonist um, protocols were performed as compared to the analog, uh, to the agonist protocol. So let me conclude that we have our registry since more than 30 years, and then it's 1996, all is done by the electronic way. Since 96, all is more than 90% of all the cycles are collected in a prospective way, and so we dispose over more than one million treatment cycles. This allows powerful statistics, for example, to analyze different treatment and regimen. Reports, this uh, reports reality and not mathematical theorems, as Dominic de Siegler said some moments ago, we have to treat patients, and I will say we have to treat patients and not mathematical considerations. And this is also an appropriate and applicable instrument for quality control in art. Thank you very much.